Coming up on American Black Journal, we are looking at the efforts to reduce gun violence and crime. I'm going to talk with the director of Force Detroit about how to make the city safer. And we'll take you to this year's Silence the Violence March on the east side. Plus my conversation with Mayor Mike Duggan and Police Chief James White. You don't want to miss today's show. American Black Journal starts now. From Delta faucets to bare paint. Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. It appears Congress is maybe close to reaching a bipartisan agreement on stricter gun control laws. This comes after a series of mass shootings across our country. Here in Detroit, the victims of gun violence were remembered at the Silence the Violence March and rally that was held by the Church of the Messiah on the city's east side. There was also a call for change. American Black Journal producer Marcus Green was there. on the ground is yeah. where a lot of the money needs to go. Meet the people who are here who are making this happen and doing this work every single day. All the different groups that you see out here, you have the ability to sign petitions, you have uh, the opportunity to join those groups, see what they're all about, intermingle and see what fits. I want to eventually see gun violence eradicated. Bringing all of these people together are the people who are boots on the ground, are the people who are stakeholders. We can eradicate this if we continue to work together, share resources, let people know what's going on and what's happening, and make sure that funding go to right places, but give people an option where they can come in and work towards eradicating gun violence. I believe we can do this. We know that there are four things directly impacting criminal gender behavior, which means a criminal mindset and behaviors are born out of four things. One, fatherlessness, right? Two, substance abuse. Three, functional illiteracy. And four, of course, mental health, unresolved trauma, undetermined trauma, right? So until we are willing to address those things institutionally and systemically right, and legislatively, we will continue to have an issue with crime. Peace. No peace. No peace. We have to address the root causes of violence. We have to address the root causes of violence. And to be quite honest, it's not just a law enforcement issue. It's not a city council issue. It's not a state issue. It's not a federal issue. This is a we issue. This is a you issue. This is a neighborhood issue, a community issue, a church issue. This is all of our issues. We must work together to put an end to gun violence. And you know, we, we talk about it a lot. But it's time, it's time to do something. We all have these really big positions and these big titles, but if we don't do something with them, what to do? What to do? We gotta stop killing our babies. And you know how we're killing our babies? Because we're leaving our guns unattended. We're leaving our guns as adults in harm's way and reach of our babies. That's yes. gun violence, you all. Yes. That's just a different form. Yes. So we've got to do what we need to do to make sure, and I'm not here to be, beat up on Second Amendment rights and things. If you want a gun and you're legal, and you, you're legal, and, and, and if you uh, 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 want to have a gun and it's your right, you need to do that. So please, please stop killing our babies. Yes. Let's do what we're supposed to do as, as adults and citizens and keep our guns safely stored and locked so our babies can live. It's a constant reminder of pulling people together, working together, 
unification because we all recognize that it's a problem. You got a lot of different groups doing different things, but they're all coming together with a common goal. And then if you're a mother, if you lost somebody to gun violence, you're sitting back oftentimes thinking that you're alone. This man right here who's standing next to me, a good brother, to Ferry Brent, you can see the shirt that he wearing. We've done events like this all over the city. We need for folks to stand up, change the culture, and this shirt say, stop killing our babies. We serious about that. It's a public safety issue, and everybody in the public wants safety, but it's about the community coming together because that's where the solution lies. Get the community involved. In order to stop these brothers from shooting each other, we got to give them something to do. We just can't look at the problem and not come with the solutions. And so I'm glad everyone is here today. Everyone wants to stop this violence. It's going to take all of us, and we look forward to working together with y'all. I love y'all. Let's stop this violence now. the groups that's doing, but we also need to show up to let everybody know that we're here to eradicate gun violence. We need, like, the different groups and stuff that's here, we need to let them know we're behind you. And when they hold their events, and when they do their things, we need to be there to say we're standing up with you. This type of event has a huge impact on our community. We need more events like this to happen more often so we can stop the violence, not just the gun violence, but all violence. This is my second time out, my first time coming. I had just got released from a 15-year uh, sentence in prison. You get to network and you get to build and be more impactful first and foremost. But it also sends a message to community that it's not just uh, law enforcement that care or community that care. Everybody care because everybody is community. It's a human thing. So it gives a good message uh, to the people, but it also encourages people to participate in this type of behavior and these type of uh, uh, solution-oriented uh, things that we're doing out here. The solution is you. The solution are those brothers and sisters who are on the front line every day doing intervention work in our community that you don't know about. Remember, we out here to make noise for folks who no longer have a voice. We're talking about all of those folks who have died because of gun violence, and we want to lift them up. And we want everybody to know that they were a human being and that we love them. That's why we carry the signs. That's why we wear the shirts. We want everybody to know that we getting ready to take it to the sh uh, streets and that we miss them, but we honor them today. As the people, we should be the ones who are keeping our women safe, our children safe, our elders safe, our little girls and boys safe. It's our responsibility. All power to the people. All power to the people. All power to the people. Praise the Lord. Gun violence is one of the issues the nonprofit organization Force Detroit is really focusing on as it works to build a safer, for your city. The group brings together interfaith, grassroots, and public sector leaders to have the difficult conversations about complex issues in our community and to develop creative solutions. I spoke with Force Detroit's director, Alea Harvey Quinn. So uh, I'm actually really eager to talk to you about this, uh, given all of the things that, that, that are going on right now with, with gun violence in our country. But I think it's, it's an important time to remind people that uh, while these mass shootings are really disturbing uh, and, and they are not an acceptable part of American life, um, that for those of us who live in places like Detroit, uh, those of us who are part of the African-American community, uh, gun violence is a fairly regular part of life for far too many of us. And it's not episodic like these mass shootings, uh, it's it's day to day. And I know that uh, at Force Detroit, that's what you're really focused on is changing that, changing that for, uh, for us in our communities. Yeah, unfortunately, violence has become a normal part of way too many um, poor and oppressed people of cultures of color day to day lives. Um, and so that has forced us to find solutions that are like unique and creative out of the box. Uh, those solutions have become over the years evidence based tried and true solutions and across the country we've been working to implement them 
you know, I'm tied up with a network of organizers and organizations that do violence interruption. Mm -hmm. um, so it is important to remember in a moment like this that black and brown communities have been dealing with violence um, for years, epidemic levels of violence for years, um, and that our young people are learning violence as the new normal and that we have victims that are embedded in community that are suffering with grief and unable to escape it because it's happened over and over and over and uh solutions are here and they need to be publicly resourced and yeah. supported yeah um uh let, let's talk about how you have to approach this this uh, this issue in a city like detroit um i i get kind of tired of the argument about whether it's guns or whether it's uh, environment or or social structure, uh, it's not an either or. It's it's yeah. both and. And I know that you are focused on again both of these things. You've got to yeah. you've got to solve it at, at at every turn. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that because um, usually in these types of segments, there is not time to nuance these conversations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Like Black people are concerned with the fact that a five-year-old got shot in the face twice on Evergreen um, about a month ago. And we are also concerned with the fact that there's another five-year-old in the same neighborhood going home to a household without his parent or his or her parent due to incarceration. Mm -hmm. And so like there's a very narrow spectrum of expertise that can help us solve for violence without further incarcerating our over criminalized community. Mm -hmm. It's important. It's important to just say like that we've got to recognize the expertise of community, the lived experience of peacemakers. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And so let's talk about how those solutions play out in a city like Detroit. Uh, I, I think a lot of people from the outside, especially look at, a, at the violence in a city like Detroit and say, oh, my gosh, I don't know what you would do. Uh, it seems unsolvable. What what are your focus points? Yeah, so literally building relationships um, that help us challenge the uh, cultural standard of violence is the only way out of this. Mm -hmm. And that is relationships at every level. We need to be building relationships with the community of faith so that there is renewed hope, right? So that we are um, setting higher standards. We need to build relationships with peacemakers so that they can, um, and so that they can stop violence in the moment. We need to be building relationships with high risk likely improbable shooters mm. um, so that we can transition them out of that lifestyle and meet the trauma, um, the traumatic needs that is causing the violence in the first place. We need to build relationships with victims so we can help that healing situation happen. And we need to be building relationships with our young people so that this they know that this is not how we should live so that we're raising a, the next generation. We're creating a new sort of standard. Hmm. Uh, you know, uh, the, the best way, of course, to, to do this, especially with young people, is to give them agency over yeah. these kind of things to, to, to yeah. trust them and their leaders, um, you know, to, to, to spread this message. But that's also one of the hardest ways uh, to do this, of course, because they're young people. Uh, talk about how you reach uh, both kids who are at risk uh, to, to, to send them in another direction, but then also how you identify uh, young people who can be uh, powerful voices uh, for these messages. Yeah, so I think like if we're honest with ourselves, seasoned professionals don't. We just don't like we have to trust credible messengers on the ground who have transitioned out of those lifestyles, but have retained their relationships hmm. to use those relationships for peace. And I think um, one of the problems is that we sort of we try to box this up. We want this to look like a normal nonprofit. We want it to be cutesy and follow the trends and 
I just left out of a retreat and as out of the box as we already are, the, the people who are at the center of the trauma are saying, we need you to meet us closer to where we are, Alea. Mm. And I thought I, I thought I was doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's hard. Uh, um, so, so give us a sense of uh, uh, the march that you recently uh, participated in and whether whether you feel like we're we're are we winning uh, this battle? I know I know that's kind of a cliched way to think about it, but uh, but are we headed in the right direction? And do marches like that give you the sense that that uh, there is uh, appeal and power uh, behind what you're doing? Yeah. So let me tell you what I love about the organizing work of uh, the Church of the Messiah and Pastor Barry and the Silence the Violence Parade overall. I love the fact that there are so many um, very, very passionate peacemakers all in the same space, all with different models. When these models intersect, there's a great, great deal of tension usually. But at this march, there is, you know, one voice, one band, one sound. We're all trying to, we are acknowledging that we really all have the same sort of self-interest to see Detroit be a safer and freer city. And we all show up in harmony. Like, I just love that. I mean, so it's always like a reunion of sorts because everybody, there's a small community of folks that do this work really intensely. And everybody knows each other. COVID has isolated us. It's just good to grab hugs and and be with people in shared space with a common mission. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and from there, I would imagine there's this sense of momentum, right? That that the work uh, flows from, from that energy. No, sir. Um, because unfortunately people have to choose and there are so many like brilliant peacemakers, right? Yeah. Like mm -hmm. shout out to Tafari Brent, shout mm -hmm. out to Minister Malik Shabazz, um, to or Ortegas Jackson, to the organizer, Daryl Woods. There are so many peacemakers who could be in this space full time who are just not. Who aren't? Oh. Wow. Yeah, because we have not um, we have not carved out public allocations to resource this work, and it's heavy. The yeah. expenses are heavy, right? Um, relocating an active shooter is going to be expensive, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, if there's somebody who you know we have an inside track that he or she may be robbing people to meet their basic needs, right? Meeting their basic needs may be expensive, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, training folks for employment. And I don't mean like these lighthearted, let me help you get a resume, like programs. I really mean if you have somebody who is trusting you to take him or herself from a point where you know, in which they identify jobs as countercultural to who they actually are, right? They may not have grown up in a household with their mom and their dad, watching them sort of go to work, do the routine, come home, wind down, sit down for dinner, right? That would be establishing a new norm for him or her, right? And so like the socialization of that process is gradual and intense and it's heavily based on relationship and on trust, Yeah. right? Yeah. And so like even me, I'm not um, directly working in the streets. I don't have the expertise to do that. Right. What I can do is lend the nonprofit infrastructure to the people who do have the expertise, build deep relationships with them and trust them to show up as their best selves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations, of course, uh, on the work. And, and uh, obviously, it's really vital to uh, to solving this problem. Uh, thanks for being with us here on American Black Journal. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I had a chance to talk about gun violence, crime, and policing with Detroit Mayor Mike Duggan and Police Chief James White at this year's Detroit Regional Chamber Mackinac Policy Conference. Here is a portion of that conversation. We've had an issue of violence in the city for decades, but if you look at what's happened in America, 
uh, since COVID, and we've studied it, violent crime has soared. You've had shootings, homicide, double some states, uh, triple. Uh, in uh, what Chief White and I are very much data-driven, there is no question what is causing uh, the post-COVID violence. It's that the court shut down. There are no jury trials, which means that prisoners backed up into jail. We had COVID in jail, so they released prisoners. I don't know what we've got, probably a couple of thousand out on tethers today. And what is happening is people who have been charged with gun crimes, people you know in the neighborhood, that the cops caught. They got caught on a gun crime, and they're still walking the streets two years later. You're starting to think, I need to carry a gun myself for protection. And so what's happened across this country is a lot of folks are carrying guns that didn't want to carry guns, and now every single interpersonal conflict uh, is turning into violence. We aren't seeing drug turf uh, wars, the kind of things we'd have seen 20 years ago. That's not what we're seeing. And so uh, what the chief and I have done, and, and we speak the same language, the key to reducing crime is not to arrest people and lock them up. It's to change decisions. The moment that individual sticks the gun under their waistband and walks out of the house in the morning, we've lost uh, because something's going to happen. Uh, and so everything we are doing is saying to people, leave the gun uh, at home. And what you have seen, and, and, and we were just at the White House because Detroit is down so far this year. It's the end of May. 20% in homicides and shootings from a year ago. We stand out in the country. Every chief in America is talking to us. Now, Chief White doesn't let me talk about this because summer's coming, and nobody uh, declares victory uh, uh, before summer's coming. But the fact is that steps that this department has taken to get people to make different decisions uh, is making a difference. And if we can build on it, and the courts are being cooperative, Prosecutor Worthy is being cooperative, uh, Dawn Eisen in the U.S. Attorney's Office has been phenomenal uh, in this strategy, uh, it's going to get better and better. I, I really feel that, and I feel that the way this chief has this department going, we're going to be okay. Uh, chief, you released a five-point plan for policing the city. Talk about that plan and talk about how that might look different from what we were doing before. Yeah, I mean, we, we talk about using data to, to drive our resources. You know, you, you can't arrest your way out of crime. You've got to be innovative. You've got to use technology. You've got to do deployment. You've got to look at ways of policing smarter. Uh, the kids, I call them the kids, but, you know, they're using technology now to get around what we're doing. Uh, they're using uh, Instagram. You know, we've got a drifting and drag racing problem where, uh, you know, the, the, drafter, the, the uh, drag racers and the drifters are picking parts of our community to come out endanger their community with these, these vehicles driving, you know, very recklessly uh, and, and using social media, which has no culpability, by the way, but that's a whole nother conversation, uh, to talk about let's get in these areas, let's, let's do this behavior, let's get these likes uh, and, and, you know, let's make money off of these likes, which we've just found out. But we've got a, a real-time crime center. And with that real-time crime center, we've got civilian analysts who are super smart. Uh, they use our technology. Uh, they get into these, these chat groups, private groups. In fact, uh, most recently we had one where uh, the kids were uh, meeting up and we had gotten a little ahead of the curve and, and somewhat sophisticated in how we were tracking them. Well, they got even more sophisticated. So they started charging uh, for the maps that they were going to drag race. Well, we had our analysts uh, buy the app and, and pay and, and go in and infiltrate that group so we would be there waiting on them. Uh, and, and so we, you know, we have to be smart. We have to, to deploy our five-point plan with that in mind that there, as the mayor indicated, you know, some of these criminals are smart. I mean, they, if they did something else for a living, they would be very successful business people. Uh, they just choose to break the law. So they're, they're using innovation and technology uh, to not be arrested. And, and so our strategy focuses on really the key areas that we're struggling with or what's struggling with not that we're de declaring victory by any means, but we've had some, some degree of success. And one of the things is crowd control and crowd management. Um, you know, when I walked in last year, uh, we had an uptick of 44% of non-fatal shootings, uh, and, and that was a problem. And we knew that people are bringing guns to areas uh, where people congregate. They would have very simple conflict, resolve it with a gun. They were you bump into me, you step on my shoes, I'm gonna shoot you. Uh, impulse decision making. So what we decided to do was to look at those areas, pinpoint where the, the high likelihood were uh, in our communities, 
and deploy in those communities where there was a likelihood of the behavior happening. We had some success with that. Uh, we took a lot of guns off the street. Uh, and, but again, with the courts being closed, it's a turnstile. They go into the court system, many of them get a tether, they walk right out the door and engage in similar behavior. So, uh, you know, we were able to do some things. Uh, the other issue or the other area that we decided to focus on besides drag racing was just general traffic enforcement. When you see officers in communities uh, doing traffic stops, you see those lights on, it changes behavior, it changes decision making. And you can find a link to my entire discussion with the mayor and the police chief at AmericanBlackJournal.org. It's also where you can find out more about today's guests. Plus, connect with us anytime on Facebook and on Twitter. Take care, and we'll see you next time. Delta faucets to bare paint. Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Edsel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Thank you.